Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of The Other Side of Addiction. Man, I am really excited to be in the studio today. Um, we've had a lot of things going on. Things have been crazy. Um, Brad and I are really two lucky guys to be in the studio today because we are surrounded by four beautiful women. I mean, we've got we've got Nicole Costello who's coming in to sit in for JD. JD and his family are ill, so he decided to stay away from the studio. So Nicole, thank you at a short, very short notice. Thank you for taking time out of your day and to spend with us. So very, very grateful for you. Oh, I'm honored to be here. I just hope I can I can do JD's job as well as he oh, does it. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You'll you'll do you'll do just fine. And um, I've got another special guest here that came on as a co host and we just met a couple of weeks ago. So, uh, Shalee Stevens, thank you Hi. so much for being here. Well, thank you. I, I'm honored as well to be here and to be a part of it. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, and we're going to do a show with you here really soon. I tell you what, this beautiful lady has uh, a really, really good story. I mean, most of our stories, you should have tissues close to you. This one, you definitely want to have tissues really close maybe two boxes make sure you bring two boxes <laughs> with this one we also have my wife uh, she's in the studio listening in and then a lot of you guys know uh, charity she's been on the show quite a few times she's actually here in the studio um she's doing her photography stuff and has said al i'd love to come in the studio and start taking some pictures so um this is this is really cool i mean this is really really neat to have all this stuff going on and, and happening and um, gosh guys and e even do my best not to get emotional um, thanks to everybody as well um, all our listeners November 1st we actually hit over a hundred subscribers on our YouTube channel and um, Brad just gave me a finger and he's like we're at 105 our goal was to hit a hundred by the end of October, and the way I see it, we hit our goal. We we made it, and we couldn't do it without all our supporters, all our listeners out there. So, thank you, thank you very much. You have no idea when we hit a hundred, what that's going to do for this podcast. It's going to take us to a whole different level, as far as like on the social media stuff. So, I'll quit rambling and uh, introduce our amazing and and nicole knows what i'm talking about and so will janan and and a charity but uh a huge huge giant from a tribe of giants um lori parks lori out of ontario canada thank you so much for joining us today oh thank you so much for having me out i'm so happy to be here it's just an honor to be here an absolute honor Thank well, you. we greatly, greatly appreciate it. And thank you so much for all your support. She was just telling us right before the show that she's listened to almost every single one of the podcasts. So thank you. It, it means a lot to all of us. Um, it really does because people like yourself help us get noticed and it's helped spreading the word about addiction that you know a lot about you and your daughter. Um, her daughter, Lindsay, is also joining us. She's just kind of in the background here a little bit, but she may chime in say hi hi lindsay <laughs> great uh, grateful for you ladies to be here so um, a little bit about lori lori lives in ontario canada with her husband frank and their two beloved golden retrievers i love golden retrievers uh, she is an empty nester and considered her greatest blessing to be her four children and five beautiful grandchildren lori has moved to tears after watching a video from al titled how it feels uh, he spoke to the stigma around addiction and how those struggling um, are often looked upon as having something wrong with them and not deserving of a place in society, not worthy of our compassion and love. Lori is honored and grateful to have the opportunity to share her brother Brian's story on the podcast and speak to how the stigma around addiction actually con con contributed excuse me, to his taking um, his life in 2017. So Lori, um, gosh, you did a post on, on Facebook here. I think maybe it was three or four weeks ago. I lose track of time pretty easy, but, um, when I read your story, 
and my wife was with me too in the living room and when we were sitting there reading it um man it had us in tears and you reached out and said al i would i'm ready i would love to get on the show and share my story um and before we go into the the really depths of it um just tell us a little bit more about you and your family and let's just kind of move in about your brother's story if if that's okay <clears throat> yeah oh okay <clears throat> yeah that that uh, video you posted i was in absolute tears al um just absolute tears it so spoke to me I, I believe that <clears throat> the stigma around addiction, um, you know, the shame, the lack of understanding and compassion, people awful, often being viewed as less than or not deserving of a place in society. I mean, that that stigma is just not right. And as you so often say, addiction is not a moral failing, it's a disease, right? Yeah. My brother was an alcoholic, but he was he was a son and a brother and an uncle and a friend to so many people, and he mattered. Um, and I absolutely believe it was the stigma around addiction that prevented him from seeking the help he needed and from people who saw him struggling helping him get help. But I'll, I'll give you a little a little backstory on my brother. Um, he's my little brother. He was three years younger than me. My sister is three years older than me. And as you so often say, Al, nobody wakes up one day and says, I'm going to be an addict. And I'm going to be the best addict there is, right? Yeah. Things contribute to that happening. And um, in our family, alcoholism goes... I know as far back to my grandparents, both my grandfathers were alcoholics. Um, I have a feeling it goes back further than that, but that's as far as I know about. Um, both my parents struggled with drinking, um, and my brother struggled for 30 years, um, maybe more. Um, and I know my brother took his first drink when he was 10 years old. Wow. Um, he he used to sit and watch hockey games with our dad and my dad would always have a beer and he would share his beer with my little brother and my dad loved us more than anything in the world he was an incredible father he would never do anything to intentionally hurt any of us but i believe that's where it began um he didn't know my brother maybe those first sips of beer would contribute to a life of alcoholism, right? He would never right. do anything anything to hurt us, but that's where it started. But we grew up in a beautiful home in the suburbs of Toronto, two parents, walked out our back gate, just miles of green space and forest and creeks. And that's where we spent most of our childhood. Beautiful family vacations at cottages in the summer. We were raised in the church. And that's, I believe, the greatest gift our parents gave us was faith in God. Um, I know that's what's gotten me through everything I, I've been through. But at the same time, our mom and dad were very unhappy together. And the house was full of friction, hurtful words, anger. My parents actually lived on different floors, which I thought was normal until I was old enough to visit friends' homes and realized most parents don't live on, you know, separate floors. So wow. there was always a lot of tension and friction in the house. And uh, they just, my parents just weren't happy. My dad was a devout, devout Catholic and didn't believe in divorce. So they stayed together for the kids. They did what they thought was best, right? Stay together for the kids. Yeah. But I saw my brother drunk for the first time at the age of 10. I remember it was a Christmas Eve and... I came home and he was down in the basement, impaired, wrapping Christmas presents with black duct tape. And I said <laughs> something to him and he, he punched me in the stomach. Oh, geez. And that was, that was the only time I ever saw him drunk. 
That was the only time I ever saw him drunk. And uh, I began drinking at the age of 14, also trying to numb myself to what was going on in our house. My brother was drinking. And um, like you said, my brother didn't just wake up one day and say, yeah, yeah, I'm going to be an, be an addict. And after he passed, I found his journals and I got to put some puzzle pieces together of uh, what he struggled with. So I'll just, I'll just quickly go over that. Number one, it was the tension in the house, trying to numb to the tension and the anger in the house. And my brother didn't grow like normal children grew. I think when he was in high school, he was four feet tall. And he was, I don't know why he didn't grow normally, but he was bullied terribly, terribly. And I remember coming out of school after school and he'd be hiding up in a tree hmm. from the bullies, right? And I'd have to coax him down and, and walk him home. And that he did grow in his later years in high school, but that, that never left him, that bullying. It just never left him. Um, and then we lost our dad to cancer. I think my brother was 24 and that was, I know that was a major defining moment in his life. My dad was his hero, and that just, I don't think he ever really recovered from that loss. Um, and then there was just one more event that I don't think he ever recovered from. He was in a long-term relationship in his 20s with, with a girl, and I, this was the girl he was going to marry, right? And he, um, he pulled into a gas station one day and looked over, and she was sitting in another guy's truck. Mm -hmm. and they were hugging and kissing and and I know that absolutely devastated him. Um, he never, he was never in another relationship the last 30 years of his life. He never Holy had cow. another woman in his life. Um, and, you know, he it's just, he was in and out of jobs, in and out of rehabs. He tried so hard, he fought so hard. Um, and he, but he had a lot of, like a lot of his life was so beautiful. I mean, he loved nature and mountain biking, walking in the woods. He was an incredible artist. Um, his Harley was his heart. He used to ride down to South Dakota, go on these long trips. That was just what he loved more than anything. He loved his niece and his nephew, great nephew. Um, he had a lot, of, a lot, a lot of happiness in his life. Just, yeah. He just couldn't. He just couldn't win this battle with his addiction. So that's that's one yeah. thing, Lori. That uh, that we've seen a lot on the show, which I know you know because you've listened to so many of our episodes. So many people that have battled the addictions that's been on here, and um, Shalise, I'm sure you can even you know feel this as well. But when things happen in our life, I mean. You came from a happy home, it seemed like, to a point, but then as you guys got it older, you started seeing, you know, the friction between your mom and dad being bullied. It's so hard for us as human beings to look at the beautiful parts that we have in our life because we have a lot more, I think, than we do the negative, but yet our subconscious mind always seems to kick that negative shit right up front and I mean, I know when I was working on paying attention to my thoughts, I started realizing how much negative was just kept coming throughout my day. And you would boot it back to the back side of your head, and then that damn thing within seconds would work its way back up. And it's sad because so many people who have battled the addiction fought for fought with that for a long time. But then they figured out whether it was a higher power or however it was. Um, my wife, I know, can talk about it. Uh, Shalise probably can too. Is But um, yeah, you just get to a point in your life where I think you finally grab a hold of it enough, the positive part of it, to help get you through that negative. But we, we had a, a show that released here this past week. Um, a beautiful young lady from New Mexico, um, Melissa Christopher, was on. And we, we were talking about in that show 
how many people she hung around with and she, at a time she felt even kind of guilty that why is it she's the one that made it through the addiction when so many other people that she partied with didn't because she was doing the exact same stuff that they did you know um so it's it's yeah this whole thing's just a hard pill to swallow and i don't think a lot of people on the other side of the addiction understand the pain that that these people go through now society would accept it if they were addicted to gambling they'd go oh okay well yeah so what big deal or they'd be addicted to eating or there are people who are addicted to the gym but when someone's addicted to porn or alcohol or drugs it's like the freaking vampire just stepped into the room but it's the same damn thing you know so for people like yourself being on the show and and these beautiful young ladies that are joining me today to help want to spread that word and get rid of that stigma as you brought up earlier I mean, do you ladies have anything to share from there? I actually had, when you were talking about the negativity and how, like, that always is the thing that can, like, it's so, it's such a small piece sometimes, but it's so, like, prevalent. I actually just saw a post today that said, when you get a new yellow car, all you see now is yellow cars. When you are, you know, doing whatever you're doing, that's all you see. And so when you're focusing on the negative, that's all you're going to see and feel. Yeah. And so it is hard though to like bring that positive back because even if it's a small little thing that goes wrong, that's that's your whole day. Like your day's been a beautiful day, but one thing happens and your day was crap. Yeah. And so that's that's so it is powerful to be able to bring that positive and that to remember and it's it really is the people that you start to bring into your life that can show you how much the positivity can be there and is there and using our stories to bring that positive and positivity and that light in is huge yeah yeah nicole do you have anything yeah i was just thinking about emotions and how they impact um when when you're a child just i relate so much to Lori culturally the way that we grew up my family very Irish Catholic. So for me, I didn't drink until I got out of high school. I just, but I was still around that culturally. Um, But the thing is, is that when something negative happens in your life, the emotion of it impacts you so that you remember. So even though your childhood may have had some really powerful, amazing moments, it's like normal that that happens in your house, that you're loved and you're protected and you're understood. But when the trauma happens, the emotion of it imprints on your mind and so that is where that is where you go to right because your parents are supposed to love you and they're supposed to take care of you and you don't have that emotion of like oh if you're never treated with love and someone comes up and hugs you and says oh my gosh I'm so proud of you you're like wow that emotion um Stephen Leary I don't know if you guys know who he is but he's an amazing Mm -hmm. coach and what changed his life is his little sister adopted sister he came home for the first time and she runs to him hugs him and says oh my gosh, I love you. And he's like, you just met me, right? But his his life had been so negative um, that that was like normal for him. But when somebody showed him love, it, it created a new story. It made a bigger impact. So I think that um, sometimes we get caught up in the negative because the emotion of it that solidifies it in your in your being. And so bringing awareness to the positive things, starting to look for the positive things in your life. I love that you talked about your brother's Harley and how much how much joy that brought him and walking out in nature and these things that may seem so little and trivial but were a big part of his his life so he had his addiction but there were some beautiful parts of him that he was able to share with you through his journal um so those are some of the things that stood out for me with your story seeing your little brother and seeing the beautiful things about him and not just being here talking about the, you know, the negative when you love an addict or an alcoholic (laughs) for me, my situation, like he stole, right? So if you're a gambler and you're borrowing money from people, but when you're stealing from people that are like dying of cancer or, um, 
it like cre- it makes you look like a villain. It's the addiction, right? But because the negative things that they've done, it hits a little bit a little bit different. Yeah. Like with me with my anorexia, like not eating food. I don't think anybody would notice, <laughs> right? But if I started going and stealing food from people, yeah. Then it's like then I create a victim and they're like, "Why are you doing this to me?" And I feel like with addicts and alcoholics, we get in that space of like, why are you doing this to me? Even though it has nothing to do with that's, us. That's right? a really good point. Yeah, I, I love that point. I mean, it, with your brother's situation, that had to be so hard for for the family members. I mean, like you said, your your you know brother was an uncle, and of course he's your brother, and and he's a son, you know, and us on the other side for myself and and I'm not speaking for everyone I'm speaking for myself how hard we forget the beautiful things that Nicole brought up and that Shalice brought up we forget those beautiful things and all we're doing is looking at that negative I mean I've mentioned many times on the show how many times I threw daggers at my wife when she was already full of daggers but us on the other side like your like yourself Lori we don't understand that because we know that beautiful side of that person, right? I mean, you shared it. We we see it. But then mm-hmm. we have that negative bullshit, again, that kicks its way to the front. And we don't handle things the right way. So, I mean, how was it for your family? I mean, how hard was it for you and your other siblings to see this happening? Oh, <laughs> I, it was, it was just incredibly, incredibly difficult. I mean, my brother was like, he would, he was so healthy, like physically healthy, like nutrition, exercise, staying in shape, um, very spiritual very spiritual man great connection to god um i mean just before he passed he he returned to college and he he got a diploma he studied health and nutrition i mean i can only imagine how hard it was for him that he was such a picture of health and and tried to be so healthy but he just couldn't this his addiction was the one thing he couldn't I make better that's not the right word conquer I don't know what the, I don't know what the word is I, I can just imagine how hard it was for him that he just struggled for 30 years and he had he had long long periods of time right where he'd be sober and he'd be doing great and then he it was just constant getting sober relapsing um and it, it was so hard, especially for, especially for our mother. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, we lost our dad 30 years ago, but for her to see her son struggling all these years and then to see him die, die after fighting so hard, he didn't make it out the other side, right? Yeah. Um, when you watch somebody fight that hard and they don't make it, it's uh, there, there. There's no. There's no greater pain. There's. There's no greater pain. Honestly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's. I mean, we've got some silence here because I think we're all feeling it. Yeah. I mean, my daughter Lindsay is okay. Sorry, I'm crying. My my daughter Lindsay's here, and Lindsay, you want to come up? I can come up. My my daughter's gonna pop up for a sec. That's fine. Hi, Lindsay. Hi, Lindsay. Oh. Hi, guys. She's the most beautiful girl being here to support me, and of course, my brother was her uncle, and they had a beautiful bond. Um, I don't know if I should. I don't want to speak you for can, you. Go ahead. Yeah. But from it was I think 2012, Lindsay. Mm-hmm. 2012, Lindsay, I don't know what the correct term is, fell into addiction? What do you say? No, I've been an addict since I was a teenager. I just I just didn't know um, at that age because it was so... I speak up. 
it was so socially acceptable to be a teenager, to be young in your 20s and, and be partying, right? Um, yeah. I didn't realize I had a problem until um, well, I, I got pregnant with my son when I was 19. And um, when my relationship split up, my, my relationship split up when uh, my son was about one and I moved back home and um, I started asking my mom to watch my son because I felt like, you know, I'm early 20s and I just need to kind of like have some fun and let loose and I would um, party on the weekends and um, I, I believe this disease is progressive, meaning like uh, for me it didn't happen all at once, but within a couple of years I was um, not able to even wake up to take care of my son and I had to uh, um, ask my family for help, right? And um, when I did that, I, I went completely off the rails, and, and I was completely absent from my family and my and my mom and um, my son for years. Uh, I was that addict on the street, the the, the junkie that people walk by. Um, you know that that's not worth helping. Um, but part of I guess my story is um, there was one day when my um, my partner that I was. Uh, with for two or three years on and off, he he died from addiction. He died in my arms, and um, that night, um, after all the police had left, I hopped on hopped on a bus, and a, a man came up behind me and and um, talked to me and asked me if I wanted to go to a meeting. And he took me to a meeting that ended up being a block away from from where my um, partner had just passed away. And I went to a meeting, and those friggin' people they loved me, and they. Um, they gave me a safe place to stay and the next morning they paid for my bus to get back home to my mom and I haven't picked up dope in almost six years. Wow, um, congratulations. And so yeah, I've got, I've got some experience <laughs> and, and, and some pain and you know my mom was asking me yesterday, she goes, I don't think I've done anything right and I said, oh my god, mom, absolutely, what do you mean when you say that? Um, my mom, when I came back, um, from that bus, she gave me another chance. She took me back in. She let me live with her for months. She um, hung out with me all day because I just I didn't know how to get through one day. And she uh, hung out with me and, and basically babysat me. Um, visited the hospital numerous times. Like she never gave up on me. And and um, the fact that she took me back in um, when I felt like I absolutely did not deserve that after all the pain and stuff that I had caused over the years for my family so um, I just want to give my mom some credit that she, you know when she says um, I don't think I've done anything right it's absolutely not true um, she, she just loved me um, even though I was absolutely uncomfortably painful to love I was I was not it was not easy right so you yeah know. and that thank you and that that's where I was going when um, you were saying what kind of pain did it cause our family to lose my brother I got my happy ending with my daughter, right? Yeah. She's been clean and sober. Her six year anniversary is coming up this month. My mother didn't get that. She watched her son battle for 30 years and then lose the battle. So I'm just so grateful that my daughter's still here because she, it's a miracle. It's honestly a miracle that she's here. Like, I'm just, I'm so grateful, but, but yeah, that, that's what I was trying to get to saying, you know, I couldn't imagine watching my daughter. She battled for, well, she was gone for three years, kind of fell off the face of the earth and she found her way home. But I can't imagine watching her struggle for 30 years and then to lose her, yeah. like my mother lost my brother. So the pain is, uh, it's real and it's about as deep as it can get for sure so thank you. So, so Lindsay thank you so much for sharing your part of the story I mean this is definitely a blessing that your mom asked you to be here because I this is awesome you were old enough I'm sure to see your uncle go through his battle right I mean mm -hmm. how hard was it for you because you went through the battle yourself and then to see somebody else that's in your family that you love dearly going through those same type of battles. I mean, what kind of emotions and what was happening with you during this time? Uh, absolutely. So um, 
growing up, um, my uncle was always like, me and him just like connected and I don't know why why that was I think you know there's a lot of feel the same feelings going around and um, I I never really saw his struggle until I started to get clean because I was so self-centered that I couldn't see anything that was going on in anybody else's life except for my own um, but when I did um, start to get clean I started to recognize the stuff that was going on and um, Two weeks before my uncle had passed, um, my my mom was talking to my uncle because he was struggling, and and he asked if I was available for a phone call, right? Mm-hmm. And of course, I'm available for a phone call. And when I talked to him that day, he was telling me how much he was struggling, and and I was offering to go pick him up, and um, he he wouldn't give me his address, and he was he was asking me for. Um, to suggest some movies that he could watch and I was trying to tell him that maybe something uplifting might be might be good for where he's at and um, I could tell him he was he was in a lot of pain um, and when I offered help he didn't want it and as I look back um, I wish I would have just went up there and just started knocking on his door and pulling him out right yeah um, but I know I also know that that didn't everybody tried to do that for me and that didn't work for me <laughs> like people i'd be kicking and screaming right um so um i was actually at a meeting when my mom called me to tell me the news about my uncle and it was absolutely devastating um to hear and you know i got um, a friend to drive me here and um i'm really grateful that um that i was able to be here although i was feeling a lot of pain i was able to be here for my mom um, because that's something I've never really been able to do. Um, so I also get that survivor's guilt, like why, why me and why not them? Uh, like you were talking about earlier. Um, I do get that sometimes, but um, it, it rocked the family for sure, right? Um, yeah. And I, it's actually, like I don't actually talk about it very often and so it's really emotional to even um, to be here hearing what my mom has to say about her experiences it's it's it's, um yeah so i don't know if i answered your question no no yeah you you did and and i hope you ladies kind of elaborate on some of this um it's it's where, where am i trying to go with this it's crazy how how life goes i mean there can be such tragedy in someone's life but also not too far down the road there's also blessings you know um you lost an uncle lori you lost a brother but at the same time lori you gained a daughter back yeah you know and it's it's crazy how all this stuff seems to work i mean we've had guests on our show that's talked a little bit about this stuff as well and these two ladies have brought it up and and I can't wait for people to listen to Shalisa's story because taking the negative and turning it into something that is beautiful, you know, Um, and I think that's what you guys are doing here with us today by sharing this story, even though there was a heartache and there was a loss because you have a loved one that's no longer with you anymore, but also to see the blessings that have come out of it, you know, and to also see the the light that Nicole shared earlier the I mean Mm -hmm. what a phenomenal guy your brother was and your Mm -hmm. uncle was you know and if if only more of us would understand the proper way of how can we help them see that in themselves right Mm because we are our own worst critics we we beat ourselves up so much when other people are seeing so much beauty in us you know and um a lot of us that are in this room are, are um, we're on a group Facebook page called A Tribe of Giants. And every week, every Sunday at nine o'clock, they have Wake Up With Giants. And it's people who have gone through so much crap. And you guys know this as well. Laura, you follow that. So many people have just picked themselves up and said, you know what? I'm not going to let this take my life down a bad road as well. And I'm going to see the best part of this I can see and by you and everybody else who comes on this show guest co-host 
guess, I mean, they're taking that and they're helping the rest of us. Because it's good for me to hear somebody like yourself, Lori, who had been on that other side, to help us understand a little bit more. And, you know, I've shared on the story on this show many times that it took me seven years to figure it out. And I wish I would have had somebody to been able to knock me upside the head. It took me seven years as well. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's crazy. So, so guys, before we go into the story um, any further, because um, I know there's some more good stuff here to share, but... We're gonna we're gonna break for a quick commercial and uh, stay with us. We've got some more good stuff, so we'll be right back. How do you start your morning? Start it with a cup of High Point coffee. Because no matter where you go, or what you do, it's always better with coffee. High Point Coffee. What's your high point? Located on the corner of 7800 South and Redwood Road in West Jordan. And a special thanks goes out to our partners in Oxford, Mississippi. This is Gregory, owner of Lift Up Concrete, proudly serving the Wasatch Front for the last 12 years, lifting sunken flatwork for both residential and commercial applications. Only fully trained professionals lifting concrete at your residence with the same quality of material and method used at every commercial job we ever do. Don't replace it, lift it. Liftupconcrete.net, 801-792-4535. Contact us at liftupconcrete.net or if you're looking for a complimentary quote, 801-792-4535. Again, 801-792-4535. Again, this is Gregory, Lift Up Concrete Lifting. Hello, my friends. This is Brad Newfeld, and I want to thank you for tuning in to the Resilience Talk Network. You can listen to my show, Resilience, every morning, Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. On my show, we will be discussing what it takes for you to overcome the day-to-day challenges that all of us face in life, as well as some of the devastating ones that may lead us to feelings of hopelessness and despair. It's my goal to provide you with the tools and skills that you need to overcome anything that is thrown your way. To find out more about my show, visit our website at www.resiliencetalk.com. That's www resiliencetalk.com and as always until we meet again go for everything that you want in life and make it happen Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, Thank you for joining us today on the Other Side of Addiction podcast. Man, the first half of the show, as I say, was phenomenal. I mean, great questions. What an incredible story that we've got. And uh, gosh, we even had a little special kick with Lindsay getting on and and sharing some of her story. So before we get into the second half, as we do on every show, we have got to say thank you to all our sponsors. And um, again, none of this would happen if it wasn't for our sponsors, if it wasn't for Brad Resilience Talk Network, and if it wasn't for all of you guys out there, our listeners, our special guests, co-hosts, our guests. I mean, all of you are the ones that's making this show what it is today. Um, 
I mean, really it is. It's, it's not one person, it's everybody. Everybody is making this happen. So a huge thank you to High Point Coffee out in West Jordan. Steve and everybody out there, just you guys are awesome. Uh, they're located on 7800 South in Redwood. Lift Up Concrete, uh, Janan and I's good friends, uh, Tosh and Gregory, they are just great, great people. As a matter of fact, um, I think we'll be going out to dinner with them here shortly. But um, thank you guys for your love and your support. Surf Pro, Brad out there at Surf Pro West Jordan. Um, we just want to say thank you to all the Surf Pros from Ogden all the way down to St. George. USARA, Utah Support Advocates of Recovery Awareness. Thank you guys for all your love and your support. My good friends, uh, Leticia and her, and her husband, Kevin, at Computer Hospital in Sandy. Man, these guys are awesome. You've heard me share it many, many times on the show. If you've got computer issues, take your computer to them. Or if you're looking for a new computer, go to the computer hospital because these guys are straight up honest. They're there for you. They're not there to, I mean, they run a business. They're there to make money, of course, but they are there for you. They will do whatever they can. They will give you their honest assessment. And also our good friends, Cameron and Austin Smith with uh, Refiner Productions. Guys, I, I love you guys to death. Um, my wife and I, and Charity, we just ran into them last week at High Point Coffee. We were in High Point Coffee having a little meeting, and those guys walked in to do another production thing. So thank you, guys. And we also want to say thank you to um, everybody out there at Taffy Town out in West Jordan. Um, 100-year-old company here in Utah, third generation running it. And they've got so many Taffy flavors that it would take another half hour for me to name them all <laughs> so i mean those guys are awesome so everybody thank you again for all your love and your support um yeah we couldn't do this without everyone so um i'd like to go in the second half of the show if everybody's okay with it about the last few years of Lori's brother's um life but you ladies had some questions before we get so who would like to go first go for it girl okay <laughs> <laughs> um well i just wanted to touch back on when you were um sharing your story Lindsay, and said that um your mom was saying i can't do anything right and when you were saying that and then even you went into the i wish that i could have done you know more or i should have gone and you know all the the would have's and the should have's and the if onlys that go through our brain our minds all the time and especially when it comes to losing someone you love and I just think that it's really important to also recognize and mention that just because we get into those dark spaces and those really dark times and those you know those moments where we're beating ourselves up for we could have done more we should have done more or I can't do anything right moments they almost seem to impact us a lot more when we've lost somebody because it like it it stirs up all the emotions and so then it's easier to almost just like get into our own like again going into those emotions and pulling those up because it's PTSD like we we suffer from from that emotionally and and um, I'm not going to go into my story but I totally get those emotions and it's it's okay, and that's one thing that I that I hope that the listeners out there and the viewers and you guys recognize too that it's that it's okay to go into those dark places. Sometimes it's just not staying there too long, but not beating ourselves up for feeling those things because it's all part of that grieving process. It's all part of the healing process, and it never ends. It it always will come. It gets less and less as time goes on, but it still hits you. And um, I just felt like it's really important and powerful to bring that up to recognize that it's okay to, to go back there sometimes. So That's yeah. a good point. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to touch on too that it's actually part of grief when you lose someone. So Lindsay, what you're feeling is completely normal when you're like, I'm having this survival guilt. So when we lose someone that we love, our world is shattered. We withdraw. We internalize. Then we rage. And then we lift out of it. And so many people don't get to the rage to be able to lift out of it. The anger is important to have, but internalizing it, we sit and wonder what we could have done better, what we could have done different. Um, 
And I think it's also a cycle. Sorry, I didn't mean no, I'm just I'm like playing off you right now because it's it's a cycle that we think, oh, well, I already felt that, so I shouldn't be doing this again. Mm -hmm. And years will go by, and all of a sudden it'll come up again, and you're like, why am I feeling this? But the anger is absolutely okay to feel and important to get to that next level. Yes, yeah. yes, it's very important. It's actually a higher vibration than empathy. So getting to that anger point actually helps you with propelling you forward. It's, yeah. as Rage Against the Machine would say, anger is a gift, right? It's a yeah. gift to help us lift out of it. So anger is a gift, just like Nick talks about how depression is a gift. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it really is if it's handled in the right, in the right way. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. 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 And to be able to explode and let loose. Janan and I was watching a movie, I think it was past weekend, and I can't remember what it was, but whatever was going on, the person had all this rage and all this anger, and they actually jumped in a swimming pool and put themselves underwater and just just let it all out you know to get those emotions out but so many of us we keep those emotions in like what you were talking about Shalice we we've got to get to that point where we know kind of how to how to release you know but yeah and also I wanted to bring up too um I was thinking of the movie Joker when you're talking about the best Lindsay and coming back right and how he's laughing and everybody just looks at him like he's crazy and they're like hiding their kids and shielding their kids and um somebody saw you on the bus because i i sit there and think oh my gosh well what could i have done different right but if i see someone with an eating disorder i know that they have an eating disorder right and i would feel mm -hmm. comfortable approaching them and saying hey you know what can i do to support you or whatever so for somebody like me to see an addict or an alcoholic and not knowing, maybe with alcohol I would know, but with addiction I wouldn't like drugs. So for somebody to know that and see you and come to you and say, hey girl, come to this meeting with me, how powerful is that? Um, oh, yeah. I think, would it have been, my question is, would it have been the same thing if it would have been your mom saying, hey, let's go to a meeting or your <laughs> uncle or your your father someone in your family saying hey let's go to a meeting um no like i i at least like i don't think so right now because uh that was happening for years right um um my mom sending calling the police trying to find me in hotel rooms or wanting me to go to the hospital and trying to get me to talk to nurses and you know I'm like kicking and screaming and um, and I don't it's it's hard to say yes or no because I think it's all about the timing right like if I was ready when I was re ready and I felt so much shame uh, about the pain that I was causing my family that it was really difficult for me to even face them or want to be around them um, it just felt too painful right um, so um, this person on the bus found me at the right time when I was absolutely uh, broken and willing to take help um, because for years prior I wasn't willing to take the help. Um, I thought I was too far gone. I didn't think I was worthy. Like there was all these internal battles that I was struggling with um, and you know um, I didn't believe in a God or a higher power. Um, today, today I do. Today I, I walk in faith and um, I believe that's why. Um, my life is where it is today and my relationship with my mom is where it is today um so yeah i don't know if it, if it was my mom that day maybe if she was on the bus and she saw oh. me maybe <laughs> it's, it's hard to say if i'd been on that bus i would have <laughs> tied you up and dragged you <laughs> yeah and i would have ran and yeah. i would have taken you some more <laughs> you know uh our friend mallory roosh talks about that there are no coincidences mm -hmm. and and, yeah. and i believe that and maybe I'm looking at it in a, in a far spiritual way, but I love the question that you had, Nicole, on that, that that guy on the bus, if it was your mom or it could have been a family member. But the way I see it, that was an angel. God put that angel yep. on that bus that day, yep. that yep. time, that second, just for this to happen. I, that's that's how I'm feeling. That's I'm getting goosebumps going. talking about it. <laughs> I do too. That's where I was yeah. going with that. Yeah. You I guys... actually got to speak with this guy. Um, I, I uh, found his his old little thing that he gave me in an old wallet. 
and it had his name and his number on it and I got to connect with him about six months ago because um, I'm sure he didn't even know how much that impacted in my life and so I got to call him and thank him for wow. um, just you know, being that person to um, to really just offer love and um, where I, I just felt completely unlovable and he was co really moved by um, so yeah even finding that card with his name like his, his name and number on it to be able to do that just unbelievable that is cool I just yeah. saying we need to have him as a guest. You might need to pass it on. <laughs> yeah. To I want to see that show. Yeah. yeah. The bus angel. The, the angel bus, bus angel. Oh I like it. And like the it. addicts being serv in service to others and how impactful and powerful it is and what a powerful message for the addict that um for being service to others to people that are are suffering. I'm wondering how many angels you know, potentially could have walked into your brother's life and him, him just not known it, you know, or mm -hmm. not feeling, not being in that spot that Lindsay was in. Yeah. And so as a family member being like, it, well, it's like my son with football. If dad tells him to do something, doesn't listen. But if another coach <laughs> tells him, <laughs> he listens to that coach, but he doesn't listen to dad, right? It's just like, you don't know what you're talking about. But when it's the other coach, yeah, I'll listen. And I feel like sometimes it's like that with, with your family it's like they're too close almost oh for sure i think also that when we go through hard times and struggles and everything it's once we get to the other side of it we have if as long as we can make expand as people it helps with our own healing it helps with our own guilt it helps with with everything like that so i yeah. think so many people that go through really 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 hard times are meant to go through those hard times so they can become that person. And you guys are doing that right now for our listeners and for everyone else that's that's out there and, and hearing like it's possible and it's okay and you know, so. Yeah, and that there is nothing wrong mm -hmm. with these people who are battling because the majority of us, myself including, don't understand the pain that they're going through. All we do is we see the outside shell. We don't we don't know what's going on inside, but we are so quick to judge by the outside. Mm -hmm. All of us are. Well, and so. even even that just made me think of you know you're. We always say like why why did I lose this person or why did this person not make it through and I did, but maybe they needed to not make it through so we can go on and share their story and make it so somebody else can. I wow. That. I, yeah, that wow. is... So much. More chills. Yes. Yeah, my arms, both of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, gosh, this is just, this is awesome. Um, I'm really, really enjoying this and what you ladies are sharing. What, what was life like that you know of, Lori and Lindsay, for your brother and your uncle, the last the last few years of his life. I mean, it sounds like things really got pretty bad there at the end. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure out where to go here. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna go a bit if that's okay. Absolutely, you bet. <laughs> and then, and then I, I wanna get to the part where, which is why you asked me to be, well, we've touched on it so many times, it's just, woven into our conversations about how the, the stigma of addiction uh, I, I believe absolutely contributed to his taking his life but I'll just I've got notes but I'll try and I'll try and go quickly here no don't you take your time <laughs> oh, okay it, it you know what it, it's a lot I haven't uh, when I lost him in 2017 from from 2017 to 2019, I was in the darkest place in my life, just in the most horrible depression. Um, like I think those two years after losing him, I was in bed 75% of those two years. I remember not opening my bedroom curtains for two years. I didn't want, I used to get mad when the sun came up. Wow. It hurt so much that I'd open my eyes and and look at the, the clock and just calculate how many hours it was gonna be until I could go back to bed um, and get away from this 
this pain, right? There's a song, and I can't remember who sings it. Um, Nicole might know it. It goes, let her cry for she's a lady. Let her dream for she's a child. But there's a line that says, sleep's the only freedom that she knows. And that was the only place I found freedom from the pain was when I could go to bed and sleep. So this is the first time I've allowed myself to go back to my brother's passing in a couple of years. And it's... Uh, it, it it's been difficult but i i want to honor him and i just quickly i'm going to go up i just want to show you a picture because this is my brother and he was a real person and he mattered he's not just some faceless nobody he was a beautiful human being and he mattered so that that's my brother brian just so we can put a face to the story thank you so that that's him handsome um oh but i'll try and go here but you know the last three years of my brother's life he just started becoming more and more distant um you know up until that point he'd always join us our family's big on big family holidays and get togethers and we're all scattered in different cities but we always <laughs> connected around holidays and we had beautiful summer uh, vacations at the cottage family and with my brother and that was his favorite place to be at the cottage on the water, you know, in nature. Um, but he stopped showing up to these family gatherings and then our family would post pictures on Facebook and, and it used to break my heart because he'd always go, he'd always comment with the same comment, I should have been there. I should have been there and I don't know what what caused him to stop showing up, but I'd always just reply, we so wish you were there, we, we missed you so much. And the last time our family gathered with, uh, with my brother was Mother's Day 2017 at my sister's house. And our mom was there who was like 92 at the time. And he looked the best we'd ever seen him. Um, just, his jeans were pressed, his beautiful, pressed dress shirt his hair was gorgeous he smelled amazing just this picture of health right the best we'd seen him in in so long and i remember my mom looking at him and saying i've never seen you look so good i think you finally got this beat right the alcoholism yeah. and uh we took a family photo with him and it'd be the last photo we ever took because he was gone four months later Wow. So after after the fam last family get together on Mother's Day, I keep in touch with them through Facebook and messaging. June, July, everything seemed good. He he lived for the summer. I mean or spring. When spring hit, he was like a kid at Christmas. He struggled with um seasonal affective disorder. And once summer ended, he started he just started kind of going into a black hole. And it's interesting that it was one summer ended that he took his life. Um, but it was in August. Everything seemed fine in June and July. August is when he called me, the phone call my daughter talked about. Um, and his voice was very shaky and he said he'd, he'd started drinking again. And I can't remember, I think I talked to him for 10 minutes. I can't remember the details of the conversation and you know th this this is what i'm trying to forgive myself for you know in in my mind in my mind i was thinking oh geez here we go again you were doing so well here we go again another relapse and and thinking how could you allow this to happen after you're doing so well just total ignorance on my part right it took um it took him dying for me to, like you said, out to truly understand the pain and the struggle yeah. he was faced with. I just, I didn't get it. And, you know, it took his death and that's one hard lesson to learn. But um, I just, <laughs> you know, that's when Lindsay, where Lindsay brought up, you know, I, 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 I kind of half listened. I was irritated with him. Like, how could you let this happen again? I cared, but 
I was like, oh God, I, I can't go through this again. And that's that, you know, I said, you want Lindsay to call you when they had the conversation. Um, and uh, I honestly didn't know what to say to help. Like, I just honestly didn't know. And I thought Lindsay would be the best person to talk to. Um, and that was my last phone call with him. Wow. And if I'd known what was coming, I would have. You would have stayed, stayed on the phone forever. I would I would have had more compassion. I would have understood that what he needed was just somebody to listen. He didn't need advice. He didn't need coaching. He just needed someone to really listen. Um, and that was a very hard, hard lesson learned. But we get to be and, human too, though, at that I same point. And we get we get to feel. Sorry, it's kind of breaking up. But. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it, it it frees up. We I think our screen froze, or it could be on her side there. Yeah, yeah so there's a lot of energy. So I'll cut this out. So. Emotional. Yeah. Energy are are you back, Lori? No, we've lost her. She's Hopefully, we can get her back. Yeah. Oh no, you can't oh. see me. We can hear you, though. Yeah, we see as long you. As we can hear you. Yeah, there. You're kind of going in and out, so it's just freezing a little bit. But as long as you can hear us, um, there you go. Yeah. I think. You know, and well, uh, have her, uh, I can uh, hear you, and I can see. You. Okay. I was gonna say, have her, uh, Lori. Could you go ahead and sign out just on your side, and then sign back in? Just go out of the Zoom and come back on? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Same link. So. Oh. Okay. All right. Yeah, I think brother brother is trying to say, stop beating yourself up for yeah. this. Yeah. It's time to let go and forgive yourself. And so he's like, yeah, definitely impacting the well, technology yeah. right now. I think and I would love to get your your input on some stuff. I don't know if I can grab her in here. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, and what she just shared, I, I, I definitely want to come back to that. Janan and I, we just saw a show over the weekend. We did a red box and it's called Joe Bell. And it's a, it's a true story. And a lot of it was filmed here in Utah and it was Mark Wahlberg who was on the show, but um, his son was gay. And he actually did this walk uh, okay you're back am i back yeah we got <laughs> you we got Good. you so um what, what you were saying that you was on this phone call with your brother and it was the last conversation that you had with him and Lori, that that really touched me and it's again there are no coincidences um, my wife and I, we watched a show over the weekend. We rented a, did a red box and it was called Joe Bell and Mark Wahlberg played the dad um, of a son who came out who was gay. And um, he ended up, he was going to walk from his hometown all the way to New York. He was going to walk cross country because his son ended up committing suicide because he was bullied, picked on in school. Um, some of the stuff that this young man went through in his life and the way others looked at him reminded me of how others look at addicts mm -hmm. and right and i don't want to blow this story because if you guys watch it it's it's kind of a slow moving film but it is really good it has a lot of meaning behind it but um he was picked up by a sheriff and the sheriff thought he was kind of a bum, and he figured out who this guy was, and they were sitting on the front porch, and they're talking. And one of the things that Joe Bell said that he wished he would have figured out sooner, and this is why it touched me when Lori just shared what she shared. We're so busy thinking about ourselves, how it's affecting us, because it does affect us, and it affects us very deeply instead of turning it around and going what is it that they are going through you know and we can only help to a certain point you know people need to learn how i think you even brought it up they've got to learn how to help themselves they got to learn how to dig themselves because my wife as i've shared many times on the show you know she told me for once be her husband and not her damn therapist because i was always trying to be that person to help realizing i couldn't even help myself because i was still angry at everything 
But that's what the father figured out. He's like, I spent so much time thinking of what people were thinking of me mm-hmm. and not realizing the pain and how life, how miserable my son's life was everywhere he went. And he was even part of it, not realizing it, that he was a part of it. And it's hard because I've kind of beat myself up at times by some of the bad things that I've said about my wife when she was battling her addiction, when she was drunk, because I said some nasty shit. I mean, I wasn't very nice, you know, and I'm admitting it. I I was an angry son of a bitch, <laughs> just to put it bluntly. But when my eyes started opening, I had to also forgive myself because if I knew if I couldn't forgive myself, there's no way I could forgive her. Um, so yeah, I mean, we we all wish we could have done things differently, but we had to go through it, I think, as part of our growth. And you even said it, Shalise, that sometimes you have to lose things to gain things, mm-hmm. you know? And and being on that other side, I've been on I've been on both sides actually, and I I still have you get to that point where you do feel those things uh, on the other side, and you're like, well, here we go again, and and that also is what allows us to be human and allows us to grow and and allows us to teach others eventually too, you know that that there are better ways and. Just like you were saying with the, you know, sometimes you got to go through the, the darkness and the struggle to, to find the light. You got to, you get to be angry so you can lift up and have a higher vibration. If we never felt those things, we also wouldn't be able to tell that part of the story. Yeah. Of like, yeah. these are, these are real feelings and it's okay for you to feel it. And, and as much as we beat ourselves up for it, it's also very empowering to say, I understand that you're feeling this right now. Let's let's work through this so we can be more help in the future. Yeah. 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 And that that was just um, you know the other thing you know during that phone call I was thinking you know we've been through this a million times before he always makes it out the other side. <laughs> I don't know if I if I'm speaking to mistakes. I know I lessons I've learned. Lessons there you go. I've learned. I won't call them mistakes. Yeah. Um, he's he, we've been through this a million times. He's always made it out the other side. This is just one more of those times. He's going to be fine. Don't worry about it too much. Uh, wow. I you know I I'm trying to forgive myself for that. Um, <laughs> because he definitely did not make it out. I didn't understand the severity of the situation. If I had had a little more compassion and spent a little more time with him on the phone, then I maybe I would have uh, realized how serious the situation was. But I think that's when I was talking about when he spoke with my daughter. I know my daughter took the time to find meetings in his area, the times, the places where he could go. And I'm I'm pretty sure he never went my I don't think meetings worked for my brother for Lindsay it's do you want to come back for my daughter Lindsay those are what she still goes to meetings those are what helped her most that's what keeps her sober but for my brother I think it was very much a a pride thing like a tough guy I'm a man I need to figure this out myself right um just knowing him though did and he he just tried to figure it out on his own and i think that was played a major part in his losing his life because all his all his lifelong friends who tried to connect to him were all drinkers and he couldn't be with them because he was trying so hard not to drink right yeah but then he didn't go out and try and find people in recovery, new friends. So he was just, honest to God, totally alone. And it's, I I understand now, um, addiction, mental health issues, and isolation are a very dangerous mix. Yeah, 
Yeah. Right. Very I'm, dangerous. I'm, a, I'm the biggest introvert you'll ever meet. I used to laugh, but my brother would say we're so much alike. I love being alone. I don't need to be around a ton of people. I'm happy with my own company. And I just thought we're the same way. Right. But I wasn't, I, I didn't have alcoholism. So my being isolated, I was okay, but not, not a good mix when you're struggling with addiction or mental health issues is another lesson I've learned. Don't, don't let someone isolate like that. But, um, you know, so that, at that point, after that last, um, phone call with him, he did, my brother used to refer to it as going off the grid, going off the grid, disconnecting from social media. And he used to call it like just the noise, yeah. you know, social media, Facebook, all this stuff. He just, he said, I, you know, he, he would just disconnect and go off the grid. And um, I, we lost contact with him and I didn't really think anything of it because he'd done it so many times before, right? I'm going off the grid for a while. When I'm feeling better, I'll get back to you. And my gut told me something was terribly, terribly wrong. And I was like crazily texting him and calling him. And finally he replied and said, look it, please stop worrying about me. I'm fine. I'm just fine. And that was my last communication with him. Him telling me, please stop worrying about me. I'm, I'm fine. So, um, a phone call with our mom shortly before his passing, I think it was maybe four days, would, would give us an indication that he wasn't fine. He called my mom at two in the morning and she picked up the phone. He just said, oh, mom, good. You're okay. You're okay. I wanted to make sure you're okay. There's people here. I just need to get some sleep and I'll be okay. But there's people in the apartment and he was just, just terrified. And my mom passed this on to me. And I said, mom, okay, look at, you know, there's our indication something is really wrong here. I'm, I'm gonna call the police. We need, we need to go get somebody to do a wellness check on him. And she got very anxious worrying that <sighs> maybe he had drugs in his apartment. Maybe he would be caught doing something illegal and he'd be taken to jail. He'd done a stint in jail and it almost destroyed him. And she begged me not to call and I, I didn't. And I didn't and that's all. <sighs> That's the hardest part for me right there. If I had sent somebody to check on him, maybe we could have saved his life. You don't trust your gut. Like, listen to your gut and your instincts because they're right. They're, they're just right. So, you know, that breaks my heart that maybe he'd still be here. But from the last phone call, that phone call with my mom, there was 11 days where we couldn't reach him at all. And then uh, Sunday, October 1st, I, I'd been desperately trying to reach him Sunday, October 1st. I heard my messenger ping. <laughs> and it was my brother and he was online. I'm sorry. No, don't be sorry. And I could see he was online after 11 days of not being able to reach him. And I called my mom, I said, mom, he's okay, he's okay, stop worrying, he's okay. I had texted a message about where our family was getting together for Thanksgiving, and I said, mom, he hasn't replied to me, but he's online, he's okay. And I was so relieved. You know, I, I could take a breath. And then at seven o'clock that night, I got a knock at my door. Can you come back here, please? Seven o'clock at... I was, I was so happy, seven o'clock at night, I got a knock at the door and it was the police. And I let them in the door and they said, do you know Brian Pierce? And I knew what was coming. I just knew it. And I remember just dropping into my knees. They said he was found deceased in his apartment this afternoon and it was, it was suicide. Hmm. And he's been there for, they think nine to 10 days before he was found. 
So this whole time, I'm crazily texting him and phoning him, being mad that he's not responding to me. He's dead in his apartment. So um, Lindsay came over, my son came over, neighbors came over. It was just, uh, I, I was just, uh, just out of my mind. <laughs> And then when everybody left, I remember thinking, oh my God, I need to get to my mom. I need to get to my mom. Don't let the police go to her door and tell her that her son took his life. So I packed up a bag and I I got to her the next day. But the I'm sorry, the ping on the messenger that I thought was my brother was the police in his apartment going through his phone, uh -huh. trying to find a family member to contact to say he was gone. <clears throat> And what my brother had done was he left his address book open on his dining room table with my name and number circle. Please call my sister. And I was so mad at him for the longest time for that. How could he choose me to get that knock at the door? How could he do that to me? Did he not know what that would do to me? But now I'm grateful. I'm so grateful. The came to my door and not my 92 year old mother's door yeah. because I think it would have just, that would have been, that would have been the end of her. So now I was so angry, but no, I'm grateful. He was, he was thinking, he thought that through. Yeah. Go to my sister and let her handle it. So that, that's the backstory to, uh, and then it, it, there's just a little bit left of how why you asked me to be here all about how the stigma of addiction uh, I think prevented my brother from getting help and pre prevented people who knew he was in horrible mental distress from helping him yeah well yeah. that's that's the whole purpose well one of them for this podcast is to get this message out hoping that we can save somebody else you know, and help somebody that is going through what you and your family has gone through, you know, because y you never know. I mean, that was many times as well. Um, I thought for sure I would come home and find my wife dead, Yeah. you know, and, and following those <laughs> instincts, like you said, that the way I call it, and this is just how I see it for me, but to me, those are my spirits, my angels, that's telling me, hey, that's their way of knocking me upside the head, going, you need to pay attention to what's what yeah. you're feeling right now because they're they're telling you something. You know, I mean, do you think your brain just thinks of that shit just off the bat by itself? No. Somebody is yeah. trying to tell you something, you know, and for people like yourself and like your daughter Lindsay to come on this show and to share I mean, this brought up a lot of pain for you guys. You could you could see it. We're seeing it. I mean, I wish you guys were here in the studio too, to receive some hugs from us all. Because, you know, there's what yeah. six of us here in this studio that would just grab you guys in a big circle hug. Oh, but, thank you. <laughs> but you know, to come on the show and relive such pain, hoping that somebody out there is going to listen to this and hopefully be there um you know Lori, you brought up that you wish that you would have stayed on the phone a little bit longer with your brother yeah and it didn't work out that way but it, you said mm -hmm. mistakes at first and then you corrected it and i'm so glad that you did about the lessons that you learned because i'm pretty sure and probably only maybe you and Lindsay can attest to this but what you learned through your brother, I'm sure now helped you with your daughter to be able to be there to listen and to open up, you know, and allow that space, that free space to where they're not getting, you should do this or you should do that or how come you don't do this when really all they're, all they're asking for is just somebody to listen, you know, and, yeah. and it's taught me a lot you know, through the seven years of making the same mistakes over and over to where, and and sometimes my wife still has to stop me. She's like, will you just hush for a minute and let me finish? Mm -hmm. But to be able to sit back and just let her say what she needs to say. And she'll even tell me at times, she's like, I don't want you 
to say anything. I just want you to listen. And yeah. that helps me. It helps me to keep my damn mouth shut because I want to be that helper. I want to put my arms around her, but I know at times that's not what she's looking for. You know, and for her to give me that heads up and knowing now and understanding it more helps her. And it's helping me at the same time, not even realizing that it is. So so thank yeah. you for sharing everything that you guys have shared. Um, and, and the one other thing, you know, that I've <laughs> learned is... Um, you know, this is such a heavy story, but I've learned, like I've learned so many lessons. So that's, I'm sorry, it's so heavy and not, maybe not all that fun to hear all this, but I learned so many lessons. And I, I've had people since losing my brother that I'll see on Facebook who I've seen it. I can't count how many times where they say, I'm, I'm going, I'm disconnecting. I'm going off the grid for a bit here. Yeah. And I am, it just... I'm immediately on messenger with this person, like having a conversation. Are you okay? Like what's going on? So that's, that's another lesson I've learned for this. If I see anybody talking about going off the grid, disconnecting, I'm all over them. Just. Yeah. And yeah. I can, I can see why. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And it's now like that my, uh, my brother said he was going off the grid and he was gone shortly after. So I need to know you're okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good yeah. point. I think the heaviness of this, uh, creates a bigger impact for your, for your message. I know that I will remember this story. I can really, I have an uncle who, uh, took his own life in February. It hasn't even been a year yet. And so I was right there with you with the police there and your kids there. And um, I just feel like it impacts people so much. And then the lessons that you've learned are going to save a lot of lives. The ones that I got here um, that I was able to write down was distance. Oh. If people are distancing themselves, isolating, not coming to events, there's a flag, there's a sign. Um, trust your instincts, your intuition, your body's infinite wisdom of your ancestors, your guides, the people in the room with him, right? He was, he was letting you guys know that he was surrounded by his guides and his ancestors. Make the call. <laughs> I have a son who was getting in trouble and um, he was involved in drugs. And guess what happened? As soon as the police got involved, problem gone right? His, his father's been in and out of drug rehab, jail, several times, several felonies. He's still alive because people did not enable and called. Make the call. Call the police. Make um, the call. Cultural changes. Just because something that your generations before you have done and repeated over and over again doesn't mean that you have to continue on that path. You and your daughter have culturally changed yes, and healed changed generations. It of your family through this tragedy that's happened with your brother. Your brother has ensured that Lindsay's kids and her grandkids, they're gonna know that it's not culturally acceptable anymore in our family to be drunk at 10, 14 years old. So huge impact there that people can take on. You don't have to keep doing what your family has done for generations. Um, another thing that I got from this is being able to put yourself on someone else's map, getting on the map with your brother on that phone call and just saying, what can I do to support you? Right? Um, yeah. With everything that you shared, it was like, oh my gosh, um, what can I do to support you? And just listening, right? People from hearing yeah. your story are going to know, guess what? If I'm in my feelings and I'm getting upset, I can't be there to support this person. And you're totally allowed to, to feel that way. You have Lindsay there like, hey, this is happening again. Like we can have the meltdown after the phone call, but in the phone call in the moment, just saying, what can I do to support you on listening? So those are the lessons that I have taken. Just the few that I've been able to write down that I hope our listeners yeah. I know they probably have a bunch too, but I hope that um, you guys know that this is information I'm going to take with me to support and help other people um, to be that angel on the bus. That is Thank awesome. you, Nicole. Shalise, do you have something? 
Yeah, I just, I'm, I'm so proud of you for standing up and telling your story, you and your daughter. Like, what a powerful, like, moment that is for both of you to have come full circle and be able to, to share your, your gifts now that you have. And I also am going to, what, the lesson that I learned from your brother's story today and your uncle's story today is a lot of the same but but definitely just being able to be there and listen even even in those moments that you don't know what to do or I don't know what to do but just saying okay I'm here to listen it's yeah. super powerful yeah thank you this um gosh it it's so cool that my wife's here in the studio because every time I get home from a show, she's like, how did everything go? And I was like, it was freaking a, such an awesome show, such a phenomenal show. And she's here to see, I mean, this is another great, great show. Um, we're going to go to a really quick commercial break, and then we're going to come right back and, and we'll finish this up. So guys, stay tuned. We're going to be right back. Good morning, this is Leticia with Computer Hospital. We are your computer repair experts for both PC and Mac. We are your community resource for all of your computer repair needs. What makes us different is that we want to fix your computer. We also do free diagnostics. We charge a flat rate labor, which means that you won't pay by the hour. All of our computer repair is done in-house with a fast turnaround time and same day service is also available. Feel free to stop by any time without an appointment. We're located in Sandy at 8721 South State Street. Again, that's 8721 South State Street. Or call us at 801-987-3993. Again, that's 801-987-3993. This is Leticia with Computer Hospital, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Hello there, this is Brad Newfeld with the Resilience Talk Network, and I would like to introduce to you Taffy Town, one of our newest sponsors. Let me introduce you to Derek. Hi, I'm Derek from Taffy Town. We're proud sponsors of the Other Side of Addiction podcast. Taffy Town is a family owned and operated business, still operating in the Salt Lake City area for over 100 years. We manufacture some of America's best saltwater taffy. What makes Taffy Town stand out from all of the others? We have a unique recipe, a whip style recipe that incorporates egg whites, evaporated milk, real sea salt. It's a unique product that is flavorful, melts in your mouth. And the best part is we probably have a flavor for anyone's um, liking, a flavor for any reason, for any season. Uh, we have unique flavors like chicken and waffles, maple bacon, frosted cupcake, uh, new this year was a pineapple ghost pepper flavor. That's awesome. Where can people find out more about Taffy Town and all of its products? You can check all of this stuff out. All of our products are available uh, for sale on taffytown.com. We ship for free from our website, so all of our pricing on there is, is shipping included. Uh, oftentimes we uh, offer special promotions and discounts to our loyal customers, so do be sure to sign up for an account and we look forward to seeing what we can do to make you smile with our taffy. Where are you located? We are currently located at 9813 South Prosperity Road in West Jordan, Utah, just at the foothills of the Copper Canyon Mine. Derek, taffy has always been a great gift to give. What are some of the creative ways Taffy Town can help say thank you to others? Yeah, if, if you're looking for gift ideas, whether to say thank you to friends or family, or maybe to your clients after such a difficult or successful year that you've had, you could look no further than to get a gift idea from taffytown.com. We offer prepackaged gift boxes that say that it's saltwater taffy from the city of the Great Salt Lake, and it tells a little bit about the history of our community and making candy for so long. You can also do customized gifts to pick out just the right flavors or colors of candy for that special someone and deliver even a personalized message in that box to them. 
So please feel free to check out taffytown.com for any gift ideas this season. Thank you so much, Derek. Please visit taffytown.com, that's taffytown.com, to find out more about the products and services that Taffy Town offers. You won't be disappointed. Do you know someone who's gambling with death due to an addiction? Do you know someone whose life is being turned upside down due to a loved one that's battling with addiction? Hi, I'm Al Richards. I am the host of the Other Side of Addiction podcast. I started the podcast due to my wife's battle with alcohol. Let's just say I became addicted to her addiction. Our podcast is helping people understand a little more about those who have battled addiction and those who are hurting from their addiction. Through raw vulnerability, we share stories that help uncover the root causes of addiction. Shame felt on both sides, matter of the conscious and subconscious mind, continued beliefs, and often confusing paths of recovery. We collaborate with real people and their stories, as well as licensed professionals to help our audience gain a better understanding of addiction. You can find us on Resilience Talk Network. You can also find us on Facebook at Mr. Al Richards. That's Facebook at Mr. Al Richards. You can also find us on YouTube. Just look up the Other Side of Addiction podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to the other side of addiction. Um, man, I tell you what, this has been one impactful show. It's it really really has. Um, Bo Shalise and Nicole said right before we went to a commercial break, ladies, thank you so much for being on this show. Um, and before we wrap up here, just want to say thank you to Troy um, Hoddle with I Am Ninja Power Real Estate. Thank you for your support, TJ McLeland with Fitness Realty, and uh, my my friend Tatiana Rose from Advanced Business Books. Guys, thank you so much for your love and support, and again, to our listeners, and to Brad Newfield with Resilience Talk Network. Thank you all, um, yeah, for everything. Uh, guys, again, I can't tell you thank you enough, I mean, for being on this show and sharing this, I mean, this story's got to touch some lives. I mean, it's got to, it's got to be helping. When this thing airs, it's got to be helping a lot. Because I tell you what, what you guys just shared with us today has really helped me. And these two beautiful ladies here with me today, it's helped them. This message is very, very powerful. Um, Lindsay, congratulations again on coming up on, on six years. I'm very excited for you and uh, great job. I'm excited because on the 9th of uh, this month, actually on the 9th of December, my wife hits her 12 month. So um, very blessed and uh, she's she's getting close to to uh, a huge milestone and she's overcome a lot of milestones already. Um, my heart goes out to you guys and to all your family, you know, for the loss. Um, but also, as you mentioned, Lori, also for the lessons that you guys have learned through this. And unfortunately, unfortunately, there are things that we can take from losing somebody that is so dear and close to us. And uh, I love how Shalise said that, um, gosh, how was it now that you, that you put it? Um, just, just with the loss of just where where things stop, you know, you guys said it. It's where things stop, and you can already see that things have already changed. So, um, before we before we go, is there any final things that you ladies would like like to say to Lori and Lindsay? You guys have anything else? I just love you, Lori, <laughs> and I'm I'm so grateful that you chose Al. 
and I'm so grateful that you that you chose today to share and that I got to be a part of it. I know that this was very painful for you and for Lindsay, and I just want to tell you how honored and privileged I feel that I was able to be here today. And I'm grateful for Janan, and I'm grateful for Al, because if it wasn't for Janan and her and her addiction and her alcoholism, we would not be here together. Right. So thank you for all of the hard work you have done to get to this point and all the beautiful things. This is proof that beautiful things can be created from things as ugly as addiction. So I just want to tell you, thank you for being part of my tribe. Thank you guys for being part of my tribe. Brad, absolutely love you. Absolutely love you, Al. Mm, thank so you, excited my dear. for my new friends that I just met today. And um, yeah, so I just want to tell you how honored how much I love you. And uh, Lori, I hope that we can plug some of the stuff you have going on. Lindsay, thank you for being such a light and for being here to support your mom. Thank you so much. Love you. And I just want to say that it's it's been an honor and a pleasure to, to meet the two of you. And I love the technology that we have today. You guys live <laughs> in Canada and I'm like, I feel so close to you. <laughs> and and I, we all have our stories and we all are are able to share those and make an impact on this world. And I just want you guys to know that that's what you're doing. You're making an impact on this world and you're using your pain and your grief to grow as humans and help other people grow as humans too and really understand and get that connection with everyone. And, and there are no coincidences in, in my, I mean, in, in my existence, there's, there's always a reason for everything. And so I know that even if your story just touches one soul, which I know it's gonna to touch more than that, but even if it just touches one, then you've made a difference. And and that's that's awesome. So thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. Thank you so much, thank you. Yeah, these, these ladies hit it right on the head and it's, uh, I do believe things happen for a reason. Um, we had to reschedule a couple things and do some stuff, but there is a reason why these two ladies are with me today because it was meant to happen this way, um, mm -hmm. which I'm very, very grateful for as well. So guys, thank you so much for being here with me. Okay, Lori and Lindsay, if there's one last thing you can share to our listeners out there, what is it that you could share that, that may help somebody that is going through what you guys have gone through. Do I have like two minutes, Al? Absolutely. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> because a really important, another lesson, another lesson that I want to share. My God, if you see somebody struggling, please help. Because it wasn't until after my brother passed and my husband and my sister, and I had to go to his apartment to collect his things his neighbors and other people in the apartment his landlord started approaching us giving us their condolences you know he was a beautiful man and people were really sincerely devastated when they found out he was gone but they started sharing stories of they knew he was in obvious mental distress like they they knew it all these people he wouldn't he wouldn't go in his apartment by himself he was sure there was people hiding in his apartment out to get him he was hallucinating a man at the end of the hall who was waiting for him to get him. Um, he called the police numerous times trying to get to get help, but n nobody nobody tried to help him, right? Yes. And this is about this is a stigma, I think. Like I was talking to one of his neighbors and she said, you know, in this area addictions vary. There's a ton of addiction. These people are viewed as less than not worthy who cares whatever hell they've created let them you know be in it and um you know if one person had just found a way to contact our family or get him help i believe he'd still be here so that that's uh if you see somebody struggling please help find a way like his landlord had our family's phone number she could have called at any point and said your brother's really struggling here you need to get up here so yeah. please help but I, I just want to share something quickly from nick smith and this is one of the great yeah the musings of nicholas townsend smith on youtube <laughs> and i came across a video he did I, I found it last week what to do when someone tells you they're fine and that those are the last words i heard from my brother i'm fine 
And um, Nick says, one of the biggest lies people tell us is, I'm fine, it's fine, I'm okay. And we need to dig deeper and listen to the energy behind it mm -hmm. and say, okay, I'm not really feeling that. Like, are you really okay? Is there anything you want to talk about? We need to, we need to reach in people struggling with addiction or depression or mental illness often will not reach out. There's all these numbers they can call these suicide hotlines and odds are they're not, I hope people do please do. But for my brother, that didn't work for him. So we need, we need to reach in. And um, like Nicole said, and Al says, don't judge, don't coach, just be a neutral ear. Just listen. And, um, you know, when somebody, if somebody breaks their arm, what do we all do? We rush to them to sign their cast, right? Yeah. If something's wrong with them physically, if something's wrong with them mentally, we get very uncomfortable and we back away. Don't back away. Reach in, do anything you can to help. And um, Nick says one of the most important things, and this blew my mind when he shared this. He said one of the most important things you can do when he does this with his kids is ask, are you thinking about committing suicide? Do you have a plan to commit suicide? And that always scared me because I thought if they are thinking about it, I don't want to put that thought in their head. I don't want to be the one. But Nick shared that when you ask somebody that question, suicide rates drop by 80%. Wow. Just by asking that one question. So, um, yeah, thank you, Nicholas. Townsend Smith for that beautiful lesson I've learned. So when someone's telling you they're fine, please dig deeper. And that's it for me and Lindsay. Yeah, Lindsay, oh. you have something. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. So many lessons learned. Thank you, Nicholas Smith. I really wasn't sure if I was going to be participating today, but it, it's been an absolute um, a blessing to, to be a part of this. Um, I guess some of my experience... Um, and what I do in my life today is when I see somebody suffering or hurting or um, that just um, doesn't seem right to me, um, I always offer an ear, I offer some food, um, I offer love. Um, I think love goes a whole long, like a long way. You offer your home. <laughs> Don't need to go into the <laughs> details, but like, all, like acts of love, right? Yes. Uh, no matter where a person's at, is acts of love go the longest way. I know that's what worked for me. Uh, people gave me love um, and understanding. Um, and I didn't think there were any people out there that could understand how I was feeling. And um, this term that um, this uniqueness needs to be set aside and then we need to be able to identify with each other. So finding people. So if Maybe my mom can't identify with the addict. I find somebody that can, right? So um, today I'm just um, a servant of God. Uh, does you know? I just do the best I can to uh, express love, uh, acts of love, and um, you know, and that's all we can do. I feel so. Yeah. You guys are doing that here with what you're doing, and, and uh, it's it's pretty beautiful. Thank you guys. Thank and you so much. Thank you again for for being with us. Um, I've been going over this little thing. I do some networking and was working on like my little 60 second elevator pitch. And we were sitting at High Point Coffee the other day and and Charity, who is here with us today taking pictures, she has a very unique way of coming up with words. And one of the things that, uh, that she come up with, and I wanted to share this on the show, and, and I think I'm gonna share this every week on the show. But it says, uh, so the other side of addiction podcast is um, the raw vulnerability we share stories that help uncover the root causes of addiction. Shame felt on both sides, which we share today. Matters of the conscious and subconscious mind, continued beliefs, and the often confusing path of recovery. That's what this show is all about. Um, you Thank ladies. You came on Thank today. Thank you so much. Absolutely. You ladies came on and did exactly with what this thing just, this paragraph that I just read. So Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing your story. I know it had to be very painful at times 
for you guys. But again, thank you so much. Um, we are just blessed to have you. Lori, thank you. Lindsay, thank you for, for getting on. And uh, thank you to Nicole and to Shalise. And, and I'm looking forward to for our show here really, really quick. Um, so again, and thank you, um, Charity, to my wife, to Brad. <clears throat> I get emotional talking about all this because... Um, <laughs> This show's doing so many, so many different things, and it's helping so many people in different ways. Brad brought it up to me the other day, and he's like, "Look how many lives you're changing," and I'm seeing it. So, thank you guys for everything. Um, thank you again to our listeners. We're gonna end this show as I always do. Remember, addiction is giving up everything for one thing. Recovery is giving up one thing for everything. We're out.